Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on whatever time zone you are from. My name is Dr. Faizan Ali, and um, this live session is part of my graduate uh, class for hospitality marketing. So today, the topic that we have uh, on hand is the future of hospitality experience. Uh, as you all know that COVID-19 has dramatically um, altered the hospitality landscape. It has changed like pretty much everything that uh, we used to, we were used to in hospitality domain. And um, now um, many of us are listening to a term called the new normal, right? The new normal, how is it going to look, uh, look like? Are we going to go back to the normal or is it going to be the new normal or stuff like this? However, um, if we sum it up, right, depending on whatever we call it, the new normal, old normal, whatever, if we sum it up, um, I think 2020 has been a very challenging year uh, for pretty much everybody, pretty much all the industries. But to be specific, in hospitality industry, um, it has been really, really challenging. So um, as uh, this industry is trying to come up with different strategies to come out of this crisis, one thing is certain, and that is uh, once we are beyond this, the experience itself, the experience itself in the hospitality industry is going to change a lot. Uh, it will be different. It will be different for how consumers look at it, how they perceive it, and stuff like this. The question is, um, how would that experience look like? How is it going to evolve? Well, what are we going to expect? Or what, what are we going to see in the future about this hospitality experience? So um, to answer these questions, um, I have invited a very good friend of mine. He is a leading voice in service design and luxury hospitality. And he's joining us from the West Coast of the United States. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure, a great pleasure, actually, to um, invite a good friend of mine, um, somebody, somebody I really look up to um, from his posts and everything on social media, Professor Deep Raja. Uh, and he uh, is joining us today. I invited him to talk to my class, to my students. But then I thought, why not make it open to others so that everybody can benefit from him? So Professor Jha, he is a scholarly um, associate professor in hospitality management and international uh, business at Washington State. I have to look at a paper to read it. It's a lot of um, things that he is doing. So <laughs> it's difficult for me to memorize. So I have to make sure that I do not miss a lot of stuff that he is doing. So um, he um, is currently at Washington State University, Carson College of Business. And he is also the assistant director of the School of Hospitality based in Pullman, Washington. Uh, before COVID-19, uh, Professor Jha, and I was just so amazed at it because uh, I was in China, I was looking at his Facebook and everything, what he was doing. So he traveled to the uh, world to consult with luxury brands uh, and tourism ministry in several different countries. He was invited as the first uh, professor in residence at Venetian Mega Resort in Las Vegas, uh, which with more than 7,000 suites and 150 plus restaurants, 2.25 million square feet of event space. Uh, it is the largest luxury hotel in the world. He also spent time with Ovrai Hotels in India. Uh, those of you who know India would know that this is one of the leading best brands in India right now, as well as the Jumeirah Group in Dubai uh, as professor in residence as well. So he continues to co collaborate with diverse entities such as Tourism Authority of Thailand, Lord Hotels, and others on project. Thank you so much, Professor Deepraja, for um, uh, coming and uh, you know uh, to my class and uh, also. Uh, for accepting my invitation to talk to not only my class students, but also to uh, a wider audience. Thank you so much. And I couldn't be uh, more happy than to see you right now in my class. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Dr. Ali. Um, I am absolutely delighted and honored uh, that you invited me to address your students and also um, to the audience who are tuning in through various um, platforms and channels today. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. So um, before we start, very quickly, I uh, would just request everybody, we don't have any other interference of audio or whatever because of the uh, platform that you are using. But I would request everybody, if you have any questions, uh, make sure you use the chat box in uh, YouTube uh, or LinkedIn. That way, uh, we can post your questions onto the screen and we'll uh, have Dr. Uh, Dipra Jha to answer your questions towards the end. The session uh, will last for around 40 minutes. Uh, Dr. Dipra Jha will talk about um, future of hospitality experience, and then we will have some time for question and answer in the end. Let us get started. Um, I will uh, be 
quite now, and I'll let Dr. Dipraja take the stage and talk about the future of hospitality experience. Um, thank you again, Dr. Ali. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you today uh, a little bit about uh, the future of the hospitality experience. Um, and I just want to start with a little bit of self-introduction to give you a sense of who I am. Dr. Ali already did a little bit of introduction. Um, I am I'm currently at Washington State University's Carson College of Business. Um, I teach primarily in two areas, which is hospitality business management and also international business. My primary areas of expertise are luxury hospitality and tourism strategy within the hospitality sphere. Um, I absolutely love to travel. And for me, hospitality is not something that I only teach or talk about. Um, I am really very, very passionate about the industry. So it breaks my heart to see uh, the COVID-19 impacting the industry in so many brutal ways. And as I was putting together this presentation, I was trying to think uh, what were my last travel experiences um, on a large scale. And that was in 2019 because I did almost no travel in the year 2020. Um, and the two signature experiences I had in 2019 was of course, hiking Machu Picchu in Peru, which was uh, an experience of a lifetime um, which uh, to say the least. And then that same winter, I went back to Ukraine. I always wanted to experience Chernobyl for the uh, students in your class, Dr. Ali, as well as probably uh, people who follow dark tourism. Chernobyl is a great example of dark tourism. That's something very grim and devastating happened here um, in the 1980s. And since then, this has become, this, this nuclear disaster zone has become uh, Ukraine's number one tourism destination. So it is just fascinating for me, not only as a tourist, but also as a scholar of tourism and hospitality to look at some of this, uh, some of this phenomenon. So as you can see that I am very much motivated and inspired by some of these offbeat places, or this is definitely not uh, Disneyland, uh, uh, to, to say the least. And as I am talking to you today about my experiences in Machu Picchu or the experience of visiting Chernobyl, I have used the term or word experience a couple of times. So what is an experience? Because today we want to talk about the future of the hospitality experience. So basically, in very um, basic terms, an experience is an, in, uh, an instance of personally encountering or undergoing something. That means to put it in a consumer behavior perspective, when a customer or a guest is engaging, they're coming to a restaurant or going to a hotel or going to a theme park, they are personally encountering or undergoing different um, or experiencing different stimuli. And experiences can be positive or negative. Like when we go to a restaurant and we have a great meal or we receive great service, that makes us happy. When the opposite happens, that did not, doesn't make us happy. Probably a lot of us will get on Yelp or TripAdvisor and give a bad review or even tell our friends and family. So one thing to understand when we are, we are talking about experiences is that they can be either positive or negative. So from a business perspective or an industry perspective, we really need to be uh, very careful and map out uh, where can we impact positive experiences and where are there possibilities that the guest or the customer might feel negative experiences. So uh, let us look at some examples of some unique experiences within hospitality. Um, and Dr. Ali, before I start sh uh, you know, showing some of these pictures, can people respond using the chat? Like if I pose a question, can people respond using the chat? And you will be able to see yeah. that, right? And yes. moderate it, very good. All right, right. so let's, let's look at um, some examples of unique experiences within hospitality. Can anybody tell me where is this? Or what is this called? The question is, where is this? Or what is this place called? So 
So we just need to give uh, maybe um, 10 seconds because of the lag. Okay, right, so we sure. have uh, uh, somebody say Sedan saying yeah. Finland. Finland. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a correct answer. It is um, it is the Kaksloutanen. Uh, I'm I'm butchering the name uh, Arctic Resort in Finland. Now, uh, my my follow up question to that that would be: So, when guests are actually sleeping on their bed and looking through these glass domes, what are they seeing? What is the experience? What are they experiencing? And this is actually a great example during socially distanced COVID times where people do not have to mill with each other. So the question I'm posing is, what are guests experiencing when they're lying on the bed and looking up? What is this part of the world known for? Northern Lights, very good. Very good. We have a great audience today, Dr. Ali. Like, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just hopping, exactly. Yeah. So this is a great example of how a hospitality experience is created based around a natural wonder. It is very unique. It is very bespoke. You know, it is not available everywhere. And you need to travel to this place to be able to experience it. Um, so yes, Jennifer says, Wonder Stars, Nord uh, Northern Lights. Very, very good, exactly. Let's look at another example. Who knows where this is or what is this called? What is this place called? Uh, close. Um, it is not South Africa, but you are close. Any other guesses? Yes, breakfast with giraffe. Okay, so this is the Giraffe Manor Hotel in Nairobi, Kenya. So uh, yes, Jennifer, you are absolutely correct. It is the Giraffe Manor. Um, once again, a very unique experience. This is not only a hotel, but it is also a conservation center for the endangered Rothschild giraffes. So people can experience the beauty and the majesty of these animals by spending time with them. And this is not a Photoshop. You can actually have breakfast uh, with the giraffes. So as you can see, that hospitality experiences can be very unique, something, uh, um, something very, very bespoke depending on you know, what you are uh, trying to deliver or what you are trying to present to the guest. And then, of course, you know, uh, I have to show the example of the Disney uh, um, experience because this is absolutely encapsulates what a true experience looks like. You know, many times I will pose this question to people. So when you are actually visiting a Disney park, what is it that you are paying for? So can somebody tell me, what is it that you are paying for when you are visiting a Disney park? So what's the basic core product of Disney? What does it boil down to? Let's hear some answers. I am sure uh, being located in Florida where um, USF is, we have a lot of people what Disney fanatics probably there. So can anybody tell me what are you exactly paying for when you are actually visiting Disney? The magic and feeling of being a child. Um, yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, memories, that's a great answer. But if you think of it at a very basic, like, okay, adrenaline and selfie, my childhood cartoon characters, dreams come true. Fantastic, all of those great answers, entertainment, um, excellent. But you know, at the basic le level, what we are paying for is that we are paying for to hang out with an imaginary mouse and an imaginary duck. That's the, that's the basic premise of Disney. And the question is, that, is then the, when we know this is imaginary, this is artificial, um, this is 
Uh, we know that this is not real, but why do people still keep going back? You know, not as ch uh, not as children, but also in the, in the teenage years when they become parents and grandparents. Because what Disney does very well is that you know the artificial, uh, the environment, or um, the specter or the spectacle may be artificial or fake, but the emotions that Disney evokes are very real. And great brands actually do that very well. They evoke these real emotions uh, amongst people. Think about all of the attributes people just use to describe you know, the Disney experience, memories, childhood, uh, happiness, and all of that kind of stuff. So where does all of this thing come from? Is there any, is there any theory behind it? You know, when you are talking about experiences, are the, is there a rubric that as an industry, hospitality needs to follow or hospitality does follow. So the rubric that I, um, uh, 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 that I actually use a lot in my work and is considered one of the most seminal um, theories within the concept of experience creation is the theory of economic distinctions proffered by Pine and Gilmore in their book, Experience Economy in, uh, in 2011. And I do not know, Dr. Ali, if you noticed this morning on LinkedIn, Joe Pine comment, uh, commented on the, on the post I made because I actually um, you know, mentioned that I'll be talking about the, uh, the theory of economic distinctions. So what is the theory of economic distinctions? What is Pine and Gilmore trying to tell us? Basically, what they're saying is that society has moved uh, from being a commodity-based society to a goods-based society to a service, services-based society, to an experience-based society. How? When society was commodity-based or agrarian, when, you know, we, when human beings were more of a farming community, we grew crops. So for example, rice, wheat, whatever, um, we actually stored them in bulk and then we took them to what we call a market. And then uh, depending on how good quality that, uh, that wheat or that corn or that barley or rice was, uh, the uh, people used to get paid. From after that came the industrial revolution. We started making goods, you know, stuff like the computers or the phones or the cameras that we are all using today to connect. So in a goods or industrial society, we make tangible stuff. Like for example, you know, iPhones are made in a standardized format, millions and millions of iPhones. You, they are all standardized. And in case of an iPhone, Apple is the manufacturer and buyer are millions of people um, around the world. And the factors of demand are the features because you know even within the iPhones, depending on the version that you are buying, the features are slightly different. Then, then came the service economy. In service economy, we are delivering a bundle of intangibles, things that are not standardized. That's not tangible. You can't hold those things in your hand, but then the relationship becomes um, basically the provider and the client. And what the client is seeking or the provider is providing is basically an intangible bundle of benefits. What Pine and Gilmore are basically arguing in the economic distinctions theory is that we have arrived at a post-service economy and in the experience rubric or within the experience economy, your, the job of a business, in this case, it can be a hotel, a restaurant, a theme park, whatever, is just not delivering intangible benefits, but basically you know, to treat people as guests and stage memories. So the difference is that instead of just delivering, it is staging, and also instead of customization, it is personalization. So what you want your consumer, your guest, your customer to do is go away or walk away with this feeling of sensations. In other words, we call it wow. Like when we talk about wow, what that wow means is this feeling of this sensation. And we just talked about Disney a couple of minutes ago. So if uh, anyone remembers what Disney calls their staff members. 
they are not called employees or staff members. Can somebody tell me, I'm sure a lot of you know people know this already. Can somebody tell me what does Disney call their employees? They are not called employees or staff members. Um, so, Professor Dipka, while we are, um, you know, waiting for some answers, right, because there's a slight delay, um, I want to ask you this. Um, how uh, relevant are still the commodities, goods, and services? Like when we are moving along, right, we are moving along from commodities to goods to services to experiences, then how important are still the commodities, goods, and services? What do you think about that? Oh, they are still very important, Dr. Ali. That's a great question. Because remember, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you are ordering food, the food per se is a commodity. You know, it is made of what it is made of, whether it's meat or so you can't say that, you know, I have tremendous experience, but I would have bad food. That's not going to go. But uh, but the point that Pine and Gilmore is making is that, yes, it is very important that, you know, think of this as scaffolding that you start with a very good product or a commodity um, or, or, you know, all of the other stuff. Of course, you need to have a very good service architecture, but your goal uh, as a brand would be to deliver an outstanding experience combining all of those. Does that make sense, sir? Yes, it does. And then we also have some answers like um, uh, cast members, cast members and engineers. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's that's very good. And that was what I was getting at. Cast members, do you see that, you know, in Pine and Gilmore's um, um, rubric, they're talking about that in the experience realm, your job is to stage memories. So basically what Disney is saying that if you work for Disney, you are just not delivering a service, you are staging memories, hence you are a cast member in a play, you know? So that is where the cast member, and now you see how this theory connects to the real world. Now, you know, this is, I'm, I'm showing you this rubric, this theory, this is great. A lot of times I'm asked that, okay, uh, Professor Cha, can you give us, uh, a real life example of how can we actually convert or transform a service into an experience. So here is a here is an example. So I, I mentioned at the top of the um, of, of, my, of my presentation that I love to travel and I travel a lot. I have had the good fortune to travel to many places around the world. And because of the world uh, work I do with luxury hospitality, I get to experience some pretty interesting and amazing things. So this was several years ago. I was in Macau, China for a conference. As a matter of fact, it was an APAC Cree conference. Um, the faculty members or graduate students in this, uh, in this call will know probably what APAC Cree is. Um, so I was staying at the Four Seasons Hotel in Macau. So I arrived, uh, I was a slightly late uh, to, uh, to arrive at the hotel and we had a conference reception that same evening. And as I was getting ready, I realized my dress shoes were dirty and I forgot to pack um, my shoe shine. You know, I usually have a couple of shoe shines traveling with me in my suitcase. So what to do, but hey, this is the four seasons, so it should not be a problem. I called guest services and I said, um, I just need my shoes shine shined because I need to go to a conference reception. Um, somebody came, picked up the shoes and said, when do you need this service? I said, well, probably an hour. And less than 45 minutes, there my doorbell rings and my shoes are delivered back, but they're delivered back like this. This is a great example of how a simple service like shoe shine, which is delivered by thousands of thousands of hotels around the world, can be elevated to a world-class experience. So uh, I'm going to pose a question, if I may, Dr. Ali, to the students in your class. So um, you all are taking a graduate level marketing class. Define this picture for us or analyze this picture for us. What's going on here? What's going on here? When a hotel or a brand delivers my shoes like this to me, what is it telling me, the consumer or the guest? 
So um, again, uh, Professor Dipra, while we are getting some answers, right? I have another thing to com for, for you to comment on, right? So we also want people to have more value from this. So I was talking to one of my friends and uh, my friend, um, okay, so we have some answers. Let, let me hold my comment to the end and then I uh, will see how, how you feel about these answers. Anticipatory service, they care about your expectations. Uh, yes, but you know, Frankly, I wasn't expecting something like this. You know, this was beyond my expectations because I would have been perfectly happy if my uh, shoes came back well shined. I, I, I was not. Exceptional, very good point, you know? So presentation, Jennifer says, very good. Yes, high quality and elegance, very good, you know? So what I'm saying that if you very closely um, respect and superior attention for guest uh, perception. Very good, very good answers. So if you look closely at this picture, you will see that three things are working here in tandem. First, you know, the care for the guest, you know, uh, first the process. That means every employee in that Four Seasons Hotel needs to be trained how to actually pack their shoe shines like this. Otherwise, this is going to become very tacky you see how the Four Seasons branding has been placed, you know? So first of all, you need to develop a process. Then people, all of the housekeepers needs to be trained. The wow factor, very good. And finally, innovation. And since we're gonna talk about future today, that means it, uh, thousands of hotels around the world are providing shoeshine service, but the Four Seasons organization asked the question, how can we innovate around a simple shoe shine service and make it an outstanding wow experience. You see, so the point of this visual is that that you can take something ordinary and make it absolutely wow, extraordinary, and exceptional. So, uh, so this is a great example of how you can do a paradigm shift from a service-minded culture to an memory creation. Uh, uh, yes, uh, cleanliness and extreme care as if they are worth 1 million. Very good point, as if my shoes were new, you know, but they are the old shoes. So I'm just saying that this is a, this is a great example. And sorry, uh, Dr. Ali, didn't mean to cut you off, sir. Please go ahead with your question. No, no, it's your okay. Question. So yes. um, one thing is, obviously, I'll uh, ask you my uh, question also. But uh, looking at this picture, um, uh, so did you take this picture right as they placed the shoes, or did you bring it inside or then take the photo? Uh, because uh, there's a question in there. I see that they placed the photo, uh, the, the, the shoes very nice, well packed and everything but they did not cover the name of the hotel, which is Four Seasons Hotel. Uh, so if you look at the name of the hotel, it still is uncovered. So you see the name of the brand there. So I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it from marketing perspective. Were the shoes placed exactly like this in front of your door or uh, did they bring it inside exactly like this or how, how was it? No, the sh you see the shoes are placed uh, on, a sh on the top of a shoe bag. Mm -hmm. So the the housekeeping person came and gave me the shoe bag okay. i took them out uh, placed them on the bed and took this picture okay so, okay makes uh, sense yeah I, yeah I was just thinking about um, yes. um, you know that yes. that aspect of it okay so my question to you is this um, a lot of these experiences right um, uh, they require interaction they require interaction with other uh, players in the scene in the service setting um, I was talking to one of my friends from China. She just went back to China, okay? And what she told me was hilarious, but very funny also. I want your comment on this uh, from experience standpoint. She uh, she is in a hotel right now. She is in quarantine for 14 days in a hotel in China, in Guangzhou. She told me that it's so funny that when they even bring food for us, it looks like if they treat us as coronavirus. So she said that uh, all the guests were instructed to not open the door as soon as the bell is rung by the guest uh, room service. So what they do is they press the button, they leave the food outside, and then these people have to wait at least three minutes before they can go get the food from outside. So how do you place something like this within the experience domain, right, where it eliminates the interaction from everything? 
Yes, that's a great question. And actually, the pandemic has actually created or generated uh, a whole new set of, uh, I would say, service protocols. For example, what you just described, I have the same setup with my, with my DoorDash delivery, right? Right after we did sound check this afternoon, you know, I already had my DoorDash delivery ordered and it is always ordered to live outside my door. And what do they do? They sit the food down, they take a picture and then they text me the picture saying that your food is waiting outside. And then I open my door and, you know, grab the, grab the door. Is this ideal? No, because hospitality is an interactive industry. But and in the next few slides, I'm actually going to talk about, you know, how the technology is actually changing and the expectations are changing as well. Um, but, you know, those are the protocols because there's a reason because you do not want to expose the hotel employees to any potential illnesses. That's the reason the guest is not supposed to open the door and so on and so forth. That's a, that's a great question. So, so yes, uh, I, I completely uh, agree with that's probably a new normal thing that we are going to uh, see a lot. So what I want to do now is I want to shift gear a little bit and I want to talk about how does the future of hospitality experiences going to change or changing depending on you know, certain, I would say, large themes. So the first theme is what I call built environment. If you think a lot, you know, almost anything experiential within the hospitality industry kind of happens within a built environment. That means, you know, when we walk into a restaurant, hotel, theme park, whatever, you know, uh, the, the building, the built environment impacts a lot how we feel about the place, um, the color, the design, the lighting, the music, the smell, um, all of that stuff. So when we think of very futuristic designs, this is an example of the Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore. It was built at a project cost for $8 billion, uh, 350 story towers, and then an infinity swimming pool on the top. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is an incredible feat of architecture, but now that we are in the middle of a pandemic and people are kind of staying away from these kinds of very large populous places, though Singapore actually have done a phenomenal job in terms of controlling the coronavirus, we are now seeing a different kinds of built environments getting more play from consumers. Um, I, I even remember, even within built environment, there are a lot of elements, like when I was in the Marina Bay Sands Hotel a couple of years ago, I was walking around and I suddenly came across this and I'm like, wow, that's a very interesting feature. And I was talking to the director of engineering and I found out that because it rains so much in Singapore, the architects decided to actually create this rain catcher so that you know, they can actually take this water and then channel it. What a, what a great way of imbibing design into sustainability. So even if we are looking at very large built environments, there are lessons to be learned, but then with the COVID-19, we are seeing a lot of demand in places which are much, much more remote. Um, for example, the Finlow Resort in Northern Ireland, where you get to sleep in these bubbles. So it is the exact opposite of the built, the very massive Marina, Marina Bay Sands. You know, so we are seeing a lot of demand being generated, uh, even within the United States. Wyoming and Montana and the national parks are doing very well, RV vacations and that kinds of stuff because of the influences um, of the pandemic. Or, uh, I mean, this is one of my favorite examples. This is the Null Star Hotel, or which means no star hotel in Switzerland. It is basically empty. There is no built environment. And the funny thing is, I mean, there is a butler there and there is no TV or anything, as you can imagine. And if you demand TV, the butler is going to come up. He's going to hold a frame in front of his face and he is going to yell the weather and some you know, news highlights like that. It's a completely different experience. As you can see that how from a big casino hotel, we are now peering down to absolutely in with the nature. Now, are these bespoke? Are these sometimes vanity projects? Absolutely, yes. But what I'm saying is that there is a diverse range of experiences and depending on where you are, it creates 
a different kind of, of wow. Since we are talking a lot about built environment, you know, um, I have been very much ingrained in design and sustainability in the last four or five years because I am fairly new to Washington State University. I started here last fall, but before that, I was at the University of Nebraska. And in 2016, University of Nebraska asked me to conceptualize a teaching and research hotel on campus. So I actually worked on that project very hard and it was a tremendous satisfaction for me to see this project break ground um, earlier this year. It is going to be open, um, 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 uh, sorry, uh, not uh, in, in 2020. It is going to be open later this summer. And I'm hoping they're going to name a room after me or something like that. I'm just kidding. But what I'm saying is that as you can see, that sustainability and design has got a lot. Like when we were designing this building, we even looked at, can we cover this entire building with the solar city panels so that the building becomes a, a, a vertical generator? How does we create net zero? Because consumers and guests are actually asking those questions from hospitality experiences. So I just want to throw it out there that how design and architecture is being impacted by hospitality experiences and vice versa. Now, you know, uh, we talked about Dr. Ali asked me a question about technology and all. Uh, so, uh, so I actually go, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the technology aspect. So here is a picture of the Hena Hotel in Nagasaki, Japan. Uh, I, I mean, it went around on television screens all over the world a few years ago. They have completely done away with human beings. Yeah, they have this T-Rex at the front desk where you can check in. I mean, it might seem a little, little cheesy, but actually we are seeing a proliferation of these types of technology enabled guest services. Uh, like I remember um, just this last fall, um, uh, you know, I was staying at the Four Seasons in Seattle and there was nobody who is coming up and waving a wand to take my temperature. Let's look at how the hotel checked my temperature or when I entered. Hey, everybody, here is how the Four Seasons Hotel does temperature check. What do you guys think? This is a great way. Nobody's approaching me. Nobody's waving a wand around me. I just go there. And can you see the applicability of this in large convention centers, in stadiums, in airports, when people are exiting, you know, they can just scan their passport, their temperature will be already mapped and you can have, um, uh, ex uh, yes, uh, Sedan is saying receptionless hotels are rising. Absolutely. So I'm just saying that these kinds of services were earlier provided by human beings, but now, you know, post pandemic, when we talk about the future of hospitality experiences, I love this because, you know, uh, nobody came close to me. Nobody was doing anything. I just stood there and it seemed very, very, very flawless. Um, yes, it is impersonal, but, you know, would I like another human being to be waving a wand around me when I'm entering a hotel? Probably not. It is not safe for me. It is not safe for the other person. So, uh, so I'm just saying, and, for, and when, a, when a brand like Four Seasons, which is on the top of the luxury heap does that, uh, that means, you know, it is now resonating um, with guests. Um, another example, uh, we just talked about like food delivery. I know hotels in China are doing this a lot. This was actually three years ago from my stay at the Renaissance in Beijing. Good morning, everybody. I am at the Renaissance Beijing, and here is their robot concierge delivering a bottle of water to my room. Look at this. It's fully automated and now it's calling the elevator and going downstairs. And sometimes when I show this video, um, you know, to my students, I always tell them, these are, these are your future co-workers. You better learn how to work with them, you know? So, 
Um, so yes, and Jennifer says some experiences don't need to be personal. This is one that would be very beneficial, exactly, uh, and save time. Also, I have asked the, this question many times, do you really need a human being to run a bottle of water or a toilet paper to a room? Think about uh, a, a limited service hotel where you have probably only one employee during the entire night shift. You can actually automate some of these services. And as you know, these kinds of technology proliferates and the cost goes down, this will become much more affordable. Well, so once again, the point I'm making is that we are seeing that the pandemic is accelerating uh, yes, cobots, that's right, you know? Um, they're accelerating some of this technological use and now hotels will, and, and the guests or diners, consumers will feel much more comfortable in using uh, some, some of this stuff. You know, um, a lot of people have asked me about the business of personalization because sometimes personalization is such an important aspect of the experience. Like, you know, how can you personalize using technology? You absolutely can. You know, as you can see, uh, this hotel in India. I mean, I walk into my suite, and you know, the the television screen uh, actually has has actually this on the TV screen. And as you can see, not only the name of the hotel and welcoming my name, but it is that red bow tie. I immediately knew that it was talking to me because I wear bow ties all the time. This is not a generic thing, you know. So you can use the power of technology to actually deliver highly personalized experiences. Um, uh, I mean, whenever we are talking about other personalized experiences, this is a non-digital one. You know, how do you actually speak directly uh, to the guest? This is from JW Marriott Shanghai. I was at the University of Nebraska at that time. Look at that welcome amenity. A little Huskers, corn Huskers uh, postcard here. Popcorn, corn, Nebraska, you know, uh, this, uh, this beautiful dim sum Shanghai style and, 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 and of course, you know, desserts. So I'm just saying that this is not somebody just had run to the su supermarket, got some Hershey's chocolates and put, put them there. They're asking the question in real experience design, you are constantly trying uh, uh, to understand your customer or consumer and actually speak to them. They are just not a number on your guest registration card or or, either, or your reservation system. Um, and, and another one that I like a lot is from Ritz Carlton, Hong Kong, um, where I walk into my suite, there is this chocolate cake waiting for me. It says, eat me, scan me with a QR code. I thought it was a joke, it was not. When I scanned the QR code, the Ritz Carlton, Hong Kong website came up with an embedded video message from the general manager welcoming me to the hotel. So now you see how you can actually personalize using technology. So this is a great example of personalization, technology, and, and innovation. Uh, if you talk about, uh, can we use the power of technology to you know, deliver experiences for destinations? I'm in Seattle. Uh, from my home state where I live now, Washington, just did that. The Space Needle of Seattle is very famous landmark. This New Year's Eve, what they did, uh, they paired up with T-Mobile and actually they created this virtual spectacular using a sky mapping technology. I mean, you could only see that through your television screens, but if you think about Seattle as a city, Seattle is home to some of the biggest technology corporations in the world, Amazon, Microsoft are all. So when Seattle is putting this out, it is more than just a spectacular. It is saying Seattle is a city of the future. We are a destination of the future. You see that how you can actually use the power of, um, of technology and, 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 and experience delivery to combine all of that stuff. Smart data. I remember this. This was, I think, two years ago. I was going somewhere. I was in Dallas Fort Worth Airport. You know, I well, sat down, uh, wanted to eat a meal. I swiped my credit card at the airport restaurant and this came up. It said, you have been rewarded. Thank you for being one of our most loyal card members. As a token of our appreciation, we have paid for your meal today, including your selected graduate. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Ali in your class, your students are learning about data and big data. I always tell people information without context has no meaning at all. 
You can have all the data in the world you want, you, my friends, but if you do not know what to do with it and how to use it, it won't make any sense. In this case, the system knew that I am a loyal card member, so it immediately rewarded me. It is not humanly possible for a human being to know this um, you know, beforehand when I'm sitting down, unless they look up my number uh, or look up my you know, a loyalty number or something like that. And since we ha I've been talking a lot about all of this digital stuff, you're like thinking, well, do I like, does he even appreciate the human contact or not? Oh, yes, I do. I mean, I can show you dizzying examples of human to human personal interaction. Um, look at this example from one of my, uh, one of my visit to a Ritz Carlton in India. I don't know, did the video freeze? Uh, yeah, it's sort of, uh, is frozen, yes. Okay. Let's try again. Okay, uh, doesn't matter. Okay, let's let's move on. Um, can you see this slide, Dr. Ali? Yes, uh, but you know, I just want to comment on this one very quickly. You are right. Uh, there's a lot of chat in the chat going on with some people uh, in favor of digital and robotics and stuff like this. Whereas another group of people are more about human and in-person touch and stuff like that. So I just wanted to make a comment. Sure. Let's see one more time if this video can play. No, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, probably, you know, the, the video is getting frozen. So basically, basically uh, what, the, um, what the video was, that as I was walking into the lobby of the Ritz Carlton Hotel, they had a whole team of employees standing there, each one holding a letter of my name in their hand, and it says, welcome, Professor Jha. So they were like, you know, so, somebody holding the W, somebody holding the E, somebody holding the L, you know, and, and so it was an incredible, like, you know, uh, uh, dazzling kind of a kind of a stuff. So the final thing I want to talk about is the concept of service scape. So service scape means, say, if your restaurant or if your business is like a canvas, you are going to paint a picture uh, and deliver these outstanding experiences or tell the story. So this service scape example is from one of my recent stays at the Four Seasons in Seattle. So this is a picture of what my room looked like. Um, but uh, the day I arrived at that hotel, you know, I this, these amenities were waiting for me in my room. So here is a personalized message from the executive chef. Um, and what it was, it was actually, show, uh, uh, you know, they had all of these uh, cheese feed bruschettas, and then also the, these are actually chocolates, which are shaped at, um, uh, just like the P Pacific Northwest oysters. So as you see, there's a localization going on here. So Pacific Northwest, Seattle, you know, all of that. And you can see Pike Place Market, which is a very famous landmark in Seattle, you know, in chocolate here. Day two, I come back. Beecher's cheese, very famous in Washington, in the Seattle area. And if you know anything about wine production in the United States, Washington is the number two wine producing state in the US. So a local Washington wine and uh, a cheese snack made by, the, uh, made by the chef. So it is almost like, you know, the hotel is telling a story to me. Um, so that every night there is a new experience. Third night, I come back. There is this little paper box in my room. Look at once again, that Four Seasons branding, a Bon Voyage amenity. What's inside it? I was staying late October, a little pumpkin tart. Halloween is coming. And this little suitcase has France chocolates. Once again, a very famous chocolate brand in the Pacific Northwest. So th this is a great example of service scape, how you are actually using the story of your 
uh, of your locale or localization and actually delivering an absolutely, absolutely outstanding experience. So bottom line, folks, when we talk about the future of hospitality experiences, one of the things that I would like to submit is that hospitality is no more a service business. It is an experience business rooted in three things, people, process, and innovation. If you thought about that example of the shoe shine I showed you, that it was all a combination of the people training the housekeepers in that hotel how to pack those shoes, process right from the a placement of the, of the Four Seasons brand to the paper and all of that, and innovation, how do we innovate around it? And then finally, a lot of time people would ask me that, okay, what's the difference between a okay or a good, say, restaurant, hotel experience and an outstanding one? How can we stay ahead of the curve? So I will end my presentation with this story. Um, so, you know, I really love fried eggs for breakfast. So for a lack of better term, I will call this a tale of fried eggs. So when I lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, a few years ago, before school started, I decided to stay, uh, take a staycation. That means, you know, just stay in town at one of the hotels. So there is a big Marriott hotel there. So I decided to check in. They upgraded me to a very nice suite. Next morning I woke up, I ordered my favorite breakfast, fried eggs and, you know, cereal and, and tea and orange juice uh, by in-room dining. And here is the breakfast tray from that hotel. I want to hear a couple of comments from the audience. What do they think about the, this breakfast tray? What do you think about this breakfast tray, folks? All right. So um, again, a while we are waiting for the answers. Uh, earlier, we were talking about uh, technology and in-person experiences versus technology and stuff like this, right? I just want uh, to have a quick, uh, I'll explain a quick um, observation that I had recently. I went to Bush Gardens, right, with uh, just, just to travel. It's a theme park here. So what they did was um, they put up a tent, uh, you know, right before where people enter the theme park. And this tent has like a lot of... Uh, um, you know, ropes. So they were channeling people into uh, rows and lines and everything. But then everybody was just passing through. There was nothing. I mean, the, the reason why they put this tent was just to get give an impression that they are checking temperatures or whatever. But really, there was nothing. I mean, there was a camera on top somewhere, but they were not even asking people to like, you know, stand for five seconds or three seconds so that your temperature... So to me, personally, to me, it was actually very disappointing um, uh, having that in, in person, like there's a person standing there, but then it gives you a negative impression because you feel like it's very careless or they're not doing something. Rather, if you compare it with that technology that you were just showing, at least there's no person, but you are sure that your temperature is taken, right? And it's accurate. Right. Yes. All right, so um, we have some uh, answers. Um, let's uh, put them here. Okay, so somebody said burn, <laughs> and uh, someone said uh, not not the nicest presentation. Very and, good. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm trying to find more because there's some questions coming. Someone said looks good, and uh, yeah, that's looks good. good. Okay. Yeah. Very Was good. Covered. There's a question for you, actually. <laughs> Was it covered? Yeah, it, it yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, the the plate came covered. Yeah, they they had a um, uh, you know they, they had a plate covering on it. So as I was as I you know I was taking this picture, uh, or I just saw this presentation, uh, it just reminded um, uh, reminded to me um, that you know just the week before this day, I was actually in Hong Kong. And I was staying at the Intercontinental there in Hong Kong. And I ordered the same breakfast. Now let's look at that presentation. Some comments. Let's hear some comments. What's the difference? Um, okay, so again, uh, while we are, um, you know, waiting for answers, there's a relevant question here. Um, okay, uh, we, we start getting uh, <laughs> answers. All 
Okay. Uh, all right. Just one moment. Yeah. So, Professor Jha, I um, want to ask you. Okay. Gosh, every time I want to ask you something, then <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> answers start coming. Very good. Very good. So the point is very simple. One is called mediocrity. The other one is called excellence. And the point I'm making folks is that, that the leap from mediocrity to excellence cannot be accidental. It has to be intentional. That means, you know, once again, just like the shoeshine example as the Four Seasons, somebody at the Intercontinental uh, Grand Stanford in Hong Kong asked the question, how can we make this presentation much more Instagrammable, <laughs> for a lack of a better term? And this is not rocket science. All they used uh, is, you know, egg rings to make the egg. You know, as you can see that there is no cling wrap on the orange juice and no frosted flakes just like that. Once again, quality is never by accident. It's a conscious choice. Experience delivery has to be a conscious choice. What kind of experience are you aspiring to deliver? You know, so I, I, I mean, like some of you were absolutely happy with the first trade because some of you said looks good, looks good is absolutely fine. But then there is a different way of presenting the same fried eggs. That's the reason I call this story a tale of fried eggs. You know, the same fried egg can be presented or experienced very differently, you know, and how um, they are presented. Look at the plating on the right, how they have used a grilled tomato and the grilled asparagus to break, to break the monotony of the white plate. There is aesthetics, there is artistry, there is a uh, you know, there, there, is a, there is a real intent or there is a real effort to actually create something absolutely, absolutely more beautiful. So today, when we are talking about the future of the hospitality experience, uh, my, my, my final comment is that you have to continuously stay ahead of the curve. Otherwise, the curve is going to leave you behind. As simple as that. So it is not a, a, a discussion between humans and robots. You know, the discussion should be humans with robots. You know, what actually helps to deliver an outstanding experience where automation can be more required compared to where uh, human interaction is much, much more, um, uh, much, much more called for. So with that, um, I have come to the end of my presentation. And here I am using uh, a, a Zoom filter and pretending to be Professor Superman. Um, so here are all of my social media. Uh, I know we don't have very much time left, but I'm sure Dr. Ali will ask, you know, uh, moderate some questions. But if you want to continue the conversation, you are welcome to write down my email or my social media handles and then contact me via LinkedIn or, or, or all, of, all of the other. So. Dr. Ali, is it okay if I stop sharing the screen and come back? Sure. Okay, you already sure. did that. So, so, um, so thank you. Uh, I, I must thank you. Um, you know, your presentation was really, really interesting. The examples were very good. I think um, it's it's always good to come out of a textbook for a while and see how things are happening in the real world in the industry, right? It's always good uh, to look at the contrast as well. So we, we can take a few questions. Um, since we promised, and I think it would make sense. Um, so there's a question that is very uh, relevant to uh, what you presented, right? So uh, obviously, many people uh, commented on your presentation. Uh, I can post them up, you know, people say thank you or good presentation. But sure. let's uh, take some time for the question. So here's yeah. one question. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, and the question says that most of the examples were from expensive places, right? Um, so is it that these type of experiences only belong to luxury uh, or can we do it in economy or middle market? How can we do that? That's a great question. I get this question, uh, you know, multiple times during my presentation. Yes, I can, um, I can give you examples from absolutely fast food restaurants and so on and so forth. I remember a distinct example um, at a Chipotle I was there after a very long and busy day. I was tired. It was past nine o'clock in the night and I'm just waiting to get pick up my rice bowl and go home and eat it. 
And as and, and the person, and I knew that she was the manager of that particular Chipotle. And as she's preparing my food, she said, you know, how is it go, going or how are you today? Or how is your evening going? And I said, I'm glad the day is over. I just want to you know, go home, eat and go to bed. And when she finished putting my food together, uh, she just grabbed a bag of chips and some extra guac. And he said, uh, and she said, uh, sir, uh, this is for you from me. Go enjoy the chips and guac. So it doesn't have to be Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton. It doesn't have to be all of those kinds of experiences. I mean, it could be as simple as a bag of chips and some extra guac at a Chipotle, which can make a customer's day. But once again, you need to have uh, you know that framework or that rubric of asking the question: How can make? How can I make this customer's day? So I mean, you know, organizations do they give their employees, team members, or their cast members the freedom to do that? As a leader, this also boils down to leadership. Like you know, as a leader, can you can you execute all of that? Like I keep telling students everywhere that. It is very good that you are learning all of these theories and all of that kind of stuff, but can you execute at this level? Because, uh, yeah, Chipotle forever, yes. So can you execute at this level? Because employers will not hire you for what you know. They will more importantly hire you for what you can do. So uh, you have to keep that in mind. So that was a great question. Um, Perfect. So um, there's um, another very good question. Thank you for your answer. Um, and you know that this question comes from the dichotomy of uh, applied research versus academic research and stuff like this. So uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Sedan, she is asking a question that um, uh, how about academics? So uh, if we have to, you know, collect data or uh, conduct research, do you think we have to redesign it considering the future of hospitality experience um, that you just talked about? Um, yeah, that's a great question, um, Dr. Sedan. Uh, if you talk about redesigning the research, you know, even within hospitality academia, uh, there are a lot of great research that is happening, but which are much more scholarly or, or who, which may not have any practical applicability, which is fine because we need that. We also need those theoretical frameworks rubrics. But also at the same time, because of the work I do very closely with the industry, I have often heard from the industry that many times academics will come in with their own biases. Um, like for example, like I know of a case uh, of the Venetian hotel in Las Vegas because I was a professor in residence there. Somebody went there and told their director of casino operations that you know that they could actually probably do a great uh, you know research project for them. And within the first five minutes, um, this person, these researchers, told them about some statistical tools that she could use. So, and basically the industry laughs at that. That means, you know, you have already come with a solution to a problem you don't know anything about. So that means, you know, you have learned some, like you, you probably have taken Dr. Ali's, you know, classes in research methods and, and learned some PLS, SEM, and some of these, you know, high founding terms. The question, and so that is the, that is the real challenge that are we preparing scholars who will be able to actually immerse themselves in understanding what the industry needs? Because remember, the work I do with industry, they are doing a lot of research. They are hiring the McKinsey's and the Ernst and Young's of the world to do their research, paying them millions of dollars. But the, like, I will give you an example. When I was asked by University of Nebraska to con conceptualize that hotel, I was told the chancellors and everybody else don't have time to read. So please write a one page position paper. That's it. So I had to make the case to for the university and the private investor to invest more than $30 million in one page. <laughs> so that was my research, you know? So it is, so, so I'm just saying that this is a different way of thinking um, and different way of teaching even our students how to write how to present. Perfect. So um, um, the last one, uh, Professor Jha, there are two questions and I think we can put them together. So I'll uh, first post the first question, then the second, I think you can answer them together because in my opinion, they are re related, right? So Soji um, is asking to give an experience, is it more expensive than giving a mere service? 
right? So this is uh, part one of the question that I believe can be answered together. And then the other part of it is here. Uh, so Gozde is asking, can we train people to deliver exceptional service or is it a gift? Um, so yeah, both are, both are, yeah, great questions. I'll start with the second one first. Uh, no, you actually can train people to deliver exceptional services. For example, you know, I teach under, uh, like in my uh, hospitality systems undergraduate class when I show some of these examples to our young undergraduate students who never had exposure to this level of service or product or experiences. Many of them light bulbs go, you know, go off in their head and many of them aspire to do things like that. You can inspire people because you can show them what's possible because if all they know is the first breakfast tray, but when you show them the second breakfast tray from Hong Kong, they say, wow, you know, it is possible to do that. So I absolutely uh, not only believe, but I have experience at the work I do is that, that you know, it is absolutely possible to do that. Uh, the, to answer the first question from Mr. Soji, uh, that not really, it is not more, more expensive to give an experience compared to a service. It is the way of thinking. So you have to actually have a paradigm, sh paradigm shift in your thinking rather than thinking of your hospitality product as a service. Think of it as an experience and design it around an experience. Like, you know, uh, and, and say, what can we do to make the customer's day even within, I don't care, even it could be a Motel 6, a Holiday Inn Express, an Applebee's, can we do something small, something meaningful, something impactful that's going to create a memory for the customer? Because remember, at the end of the day, you know, people will always remember how you made them feel. If you made them feel good, if you made them feel important, taken care of, they not only they are going to come back and reward you, but they're going to tell their friends, family, post it on Facebook and social media. And that's why the power of experience is much bigger than the power of service. I hope that was that answered the question. Dr. Sure, Ryan. perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jam. So um, this is all uh, we have time for today because we are already eight minutes over. But um, I'm pretty sure that everybody enjoyed those uh, extra eight minutes as well because it was just so, so eye-opening. Um, I thank you again uh, for your presentation, and I would like to thank my students as well as the external audience who joined us uh, from uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, and other social, social media platforms. It has been a very engaging and interactive session. I, I think everybody was quite active, so thank you for that. Uh, if you have any additional questions uh, for all of you, including my students or external audience, uh, feel free to uh, connect with Professor Jha on social media or email LinkedIn. He is very active. I think um, along with Dr. Jehan, Professor Jha is the other most social active person that I see on social media. So uh, that's good. And um, in the end, on behalf of uh, uh, you know, myself, School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at the University of South Florida. I wish you all uh, good health and a great rest of your day. Thank you very much and stay tuned because there are some more very interesting uh, sessions coming on. Thank you again. Uh, thank you, Professor Ali. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jihan. You guys are the best. So I appreciate the opportunity. So.